The summer of 1813 was a time of explosive news and even wilder rumors from the Creek Nation. Intelligence of the Battle of Tuckabachi and the Big Warrior's desperate retreat to the Chattahoochee River shook Georgia, Tennessee, and the Mississippi Territory. Even more stunning was the warning from the Choctaw Nation on July 15th that 2,000 Creek warriors had raised a red stick in support of the Prophet Francis, and that as many as 80 Choctaw had joined them. Rumors rattled the frontier. The little warrior who was put to death had a letter, it is said, from the British general in Canada to the governor in Pensacola to furnish the Indians with arms and ammunition. A great number have gone down, Moniac thinks 300, to Pensacola for that purpose and will probably return this week should they be supplied. They are to attack both our settlements, those on the Mississippi, Tennessee, and Georgia. U.S. District Judge Harry Tolman, Fort Stoddart, July 19, 1813. The Red Stick Supply Party reached Pensacola in the weeks after the fall of Tuckabachi. It was not a trading party, as some still claim. But there is no evidence other than rumors that the Prophet Francis and other Red Stick leaders planned an attack on the U.S. frontiers. Well, the Red Sticks needed ammunition, and so Peter McQueen, who was the war chief of Tallahassee, started off for Pensacola uh, with about 300 Red Sticks. And they headed down, and along the way, some of the Matisse, who were people of mixed race, who lived along the Tensaw region in Alabama, were told by the Red Sticks that they had nothing to fear. In fact, one of the prophets told some of them that um, if they joined the Red Stick cause, um, they had nothing to fear, that they did not plan to attack the frontiers. Now, there were wild rumors that spread at the time that the Red Sticks planned an attack on the United States, um, but whether this was based on any reality or not, whether it was just complete rumor, whether it was made up, no one really knows. But in some of the records of the time, um, it does appear that one of the prophets very specifically said that they were settling affairs in the nation. McQueen obtained about 300 pounds of powder and a matching amount of lead and started back for the Creek Nation from Pensacola. The precious cargo tied on the backs of pack horses. Several spies observed the delivery of the ammunition to the Red Sticks and spread alarm through the frontier settlements. Without waiting for orders or approval, Colonel James Collar organized around 180 volunteers and rode out to attack McQueen and his warriors. Well, Colonel Collar, he had around 175, 180 men. They rode east from the Mount Vernon or Fort Stoddard area of Alabama. He sent word to headquarters that he was going to head out and try to cut off McQueen's party as it came back up from Pensacola. Um, he didn't allow time for a response to come. He basically rode without orders, um, not realizing he was going to precipitate a complete war with the Red Stick faction of the Creek Nation, which they now knew numbered around 2,000 or more warriors. Um, McQueen's party had about 300, um, so he was riding out to oppose a Red Stick force that was about twice the size of his own command. They basically planned to meet them somewhere along the route of the Pensacola Road as it paralleled Burnt Corn Creek. Um, they believed they could defeat them, seize this ammunition, and prevent war. But what really was going to happen is that they were going to ignite a war with the Red Sticks. There are two stories of what happened next. The first and best known account is a story given by the frontier settlers after their attack ended in disaster at the Battle of Burnt Corn Creek. From the best information I could receive, I suppose 10 or 12 of the Indians were killed and many more wounded. Four of the whites were killed and eight or nine wounded. The Indians were in the swamp and our men in open woods. The commander thought it prudent to order a retreat. The whites generally broke and ran in great confusion. And Colonel Collier, although he used every exertion which a brave officer could do and was supported by several officers and privates, was unable to rally his men or restrain their precipitate flight. The Indians discovered their confusion and pursued them nearly a mile in open woods, and nothing saved our men from a general slaughter but the inability of the Indians to overtake them. Colonel Joseph Carson, Mount Vernon, July 30th, 1813. The Red Stick account came from either Peter McQueen or one of his warriors. 
A Native American woman, the wife of an Indian countryman named Hardy Reed, heard the story and saw the scalps of two dead frontiersmen in the days after the battle. On their return, they were met by James Cornell, David Tate, and a small body of white people where the old Tinsall Road turns off to Pensacola. An engagement took place. The battle lasted three hours. McQueen's party kept the ground. His force was 350 strong, that of Cornell's party not ascertained. It is supposed that Cornell and Tate are wounded. McQueen got Tate's horse. They scalped the two white men. Native American woman, August 4th, 1813. The actual number killed in the battle was two frontiersmen and five red sticks. One of the latter was a maroon, or escaped slave, who had joined the Native American force. Colonel Collar's volunteers captured some of the red stick ammunition, but the defeat of the Mississippi volunteers was devastating and complete. Relatives of the red sticks killed in battle now called out for vengeance against those who had attacked McQueen's supply party. Their demands could not be ignored and the prophet's dream of destroying the big warrior's party once and for all had to be postponed. The focus instead turned to a makeshift frontier stockade in the Tinsaw settlement of today's Alabama. We will have the story of the fall of Fort Mims when our series continues. Exploring the history of the War of 1812 on the Gulf Coast, I'm Rachel Conrad for Two Egg TV.